Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. If you're not watching this on the new Watchbox app, you're doing it all wrong. New features available on the Apple App Store or Google Play. You'll see Watchbox Studios content one week early, exclusive on the app. Plus, you can read editorial content from our own Jack Foster and your favorite third party watch journals, magazines, and blogs. Also, shop our inventory, browse 3,000 pre owned and vintage luxury watches while also storing your collection, including details of condition, box, and papers. Finally, stay in touch with me, my team, and our entire family of Watchbox client advisors around the world. I'm Tim, and I'll see you on the app. Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to Collector Conversations. In a world dominated by super rigid collecting philosophies and dogmatic collectors, it is a relief to find a collection where anything goes, anything and everything does here today, thanks to John. John, welcome to the show. Oh, pleasure to be here. So what's really exciting to me is that you were interested in watches for a long time, but you're a relatively recent collector. Take me back to the, the origin of your interest, and then we'll talk about the hardware. Oh, sure, absolutely. So this is back in the early 90s. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the Middle East, so we spent a lot of time traveling from you know, Saudi Arabia to India. Our source of entertainment in the flight is usually the flight magazine. It's called the Alan or Sahlan, means welcome in Arabic. So it has a lot of pictures about watches, colognes in general, you know, and also my, when I grew up, my dad used to preach a lot about the importance of time and punctuality. So it was kind of, and also I, I see him taking care of his watches, uh, you know, and that's kind of, that's my initial stages to the world of watches. Uh, that. So that's kind of the formative early experience. Much later, you started to look into actually owning watches. But before you got into the luxury space, were there any watches Timex, Casio, anything that you remember that yes. sped you along? Right, uh, yes. I mean, it was, um, you know, we had a lot of Seiko Fies growing up and Casios as well. And then the one that particularly piqued my interest is the Swatch Irony. They launched in 97, 98 in the Middle East and they had a lot of uh, holdings and an advertisement for that brand in particular. Uh, that piqued my interest because of the way they marketed themselves and that, that got my attention and I asked uh, for my uh, the watch uh, with my dad and then he said, like, when you, when you get good, good grades, especially in mathematics and science, you can get one. And I did. And that's, is my very first watch that I kind of remember, like, when I'm a greater position. Okay. So now, around 2018, I believe, you start to look at the right. true luxury class of watches. Rolex was always an aspiration, but that's not where you started. Correct. Yes. So what happened was, like, when I got into the watches and I thought, if you have the money, you can get one. But I realize it's not something that you can get it, but obviously you need to have a good re relationship and rapport with people and whatnot. So that's got into, so I'm looking into other watches as well, starting out with um, JLC and a few other brands, IWC, the Spitfire with the bronze case. Uh, and I looked into other watches as well. And I started picking up Panerai, that was my first watch. It's also, one of the things that influenced me is Amazonia was like the, the brand ambassador for the brand at the point in time. And just for our audience, who is he? Oh, yes. He's a very well-known cricketer uh, based in India. He also won the World Cup for us in 2011. So he's like a celebrated hero in India and people from the Indian subcontinent. And he was an authentic Panerai buyer, not a compensated endorser. To put exactly. It like yes, that. yes. I've seen him wearing the watch before he was a brand ambassador. You know, also this is a very relatively, it's, Panerai is known for big cases. This one in particular is a 42 mm case. It has the GMT functionality, power reserve, everything that you look for in a Panerai. Now, what I find interesting is that you jumped into the Panerai game basically head first because you went straight to strap swapping, which is a huge cultural <laughs> thing for Paneristi. <laughs> Tell me about this strap. Uh, explain the material, where it came from, and then also what the tricolore is all about right there. Sure. Uh, this is uh, this is a tannery based in Japan. It's called the Himeji Kurozon. They actually make these straps for Grand Seiko Kodo, um, which won the GPHG award, I believe, in 2022. This is from the same tannery. Uh, I got it uh, sourced with my good friend and Aaron Bespoke. He customized it for me based on what I wanted. 
So the color there, it's actually of the, the French uh, color with the flag, because the dial uh, is inspired by French streets. Like the grid of Paris. Right. It's called Hope Nail or Claude de Paris. Uh, and then it's also called Waffle, and I love waffles, so it is everything in a, in a, that I can look for. Now, you mentioned to me that you travel with this watch most often. Right. It is a GMT. It is a power reserve. Is it just the practicality? Uh, yes. I mean, it, like I said, I was, I was at the point in time I was traveling a lot. And also, it, it helps me to keep track of my time where my parents are in Saudi at the point in time or if they're in India. So it's kind of easier to like look into the watch and see what time is a good time to call them or not. So it, it, it's very useful and utilitarian. And so the strap comes from the same supplier that creates the strap for the Kodo Tourbillon. Correct. So you also mentioned earlier that this, this has something to do with traditional Japanese armor? Correct, yes. Yeah. So back in the day, uh, I've been told like they, this is also used by the samurais for their armor and whatnot. So it, it goes through a special uh, tanning process and also they apply a lacquer paint on it. Uh, so it's also like if you look into the, la the light, it actually it shines a lot like a diamond. It's actually called a black diamond. Um, and it also has the same strap for the Resindo dial as well. Yeah, when I first saw the gloss on there, now I realize it's lacquer. I, I thought it was some sort of scale pattern, or just because I had a toad leather strap the other day in my office, I'm like, is it is toad now a thing? Right. But no, this this is a conventional calfskin, but traded and right. treated unconventionally. Right. And then a lot of people think this is a shark skin when they see it for the very first time. But it, but it's not. It's 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 a calf leather. It goes through a special, like I said, it's special processing to get that. Now let's talk briefly about your sort of GMT sub theme because you've got several GMTs in the collection now, mm -hmm. and presumably you don't need to keep track of more than two time zones. So is this just a feature you like? Is it just kind of a theme within the collection? Yeah, like I said, when I started the the, the watch collecting journey, like my parents were in different countries, so it kind of helped me in the process. Um, that's why I started off because it's like you know it, it helps me and it also has some uh, useful needs to it. But I mean, after a point in time, I thought there's so many GMT. Let me branch into other other things as well, and that's how you know I started um, collecting other things. So this one is a very peculiar one. So it has the um, the Eastern Hindu numerals. So I also have some three watches here that are Eastern Hindu numerals because I was brought up in the Middle East, and it's you know it's kind of I want to have that connecting uh, connection to where I started and where I grew up. Um, so this is actually from. Ahmed Siddiqui and Sons. They made a braid line uh, made in collaboration with Edhar Airways, and they made about, I believe it's 500 of them. And I was lucky enough to get that one from Ahmed Siddiqui. So you were born in India, but you grew up in Saudi Arabia. Correct, yes. And this watch is pretty exhaustive in that it doesn't have the Eastern Arabic numerals on the dial, but also the date disc and the day disc. Right. Very, very cool. I gotta say, there's a wonderful richness about this piece, especially with the black steel. Yeah. Really cool looking. And it, it also had a lot of attention during the Dubai Watch Week when we had in New York. And I believe Mark Shaw actually has this watch in his Instagram page as well. And I think I, when we first met, I think I was wearing the same watch, uh, this one that you have on hand. Now, speaking of meeting outside of the office, you're part of the watch community. You travel to events and you're associated with various watch clubs. Let's just talk a little bit about the community that you've experienced in the watch world and, you know, what you rely on and who you rely on to get your information. You mentioned you're in a watch club out of Boston, but right. also the Grand Seiko GS9 club. Let's talk about Boston first. Sure. So I was introduced to Boston Watch uh, Watch Out Group by a good friend of mine, Joel Fernandez. So he kind of introduced me to the club. At the point in time, it was about a uh, little under 50, I would say. One of the things that came out of COVID is probably the rise of all these watch clubs and we have a lot of uh, Zoom meetings and whatnot. So it kind of helped me to grow my knowledge and introduce to people. So the, the community did help me. And also when we moved to Connecticut, I didn't know a lot of folks uh, back in Connecticut, but a lot of people from the group, they all helped me, uh, you know, to get used to Connecticut because I didn't have friends. Uh, I was working from home, so that I don't have a limited opportunity to meet new people. And also, once you're after a certain age, it's very hard for you to make new friends. But this did help me, and also it helped me to get in uh, contact with one of the ADs there, called Lux and Bond Green, and there's, there's a family-owned business being there for 1898. Very cool. So you you found this club out of Boston, mm -hmm. and they've got a sort of a rich online scene as well. Right. Uh, we originally met at one of the satellite operations of Dubai Watch Week. They did a satellite show in New York last fall, uh, and then also with the Grand Seiko GS9 Club, you're you're involved in that brand. I think it's important to remind viewers that there are a lot of different groups and support structures for folks who are getting into this hobby. It's not necessarily just you alone. Right. 
Right. I mean, it's, it's a lot out there that, you know, you, you meet a lot of people and not just these two clubs, another watch club, the classic watch club that I recently joined after the wind up last year. A good friend of mine whom I actually met in GS9 club, Alex Rosa, he introduced me to Henry Flores, who's actually, uh, you know, he's the, he started the group and the very friendly group and very nice collectors. As a matter of fact, they actually went to the Watches in Wonder uh, with like seven, eight people. They went, they had a blast. I couldn't go. But it's 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 good to to your point. It's good to be involved and get to know their hobby, and it's also more educational. And speaking of the Dubai Watch Week, Tim, I think all these events are more educational. So that's where you get to know a lot, uh, and it's also it's, it's a it's a good dosage of entertainment and, and also the the information that you gather. And I think it it did help me a lot to understand some of the watches and the moments inside and the dials and whatnot. So if you see my collection. I'm very peculiar about the dials in, in particular, so no, no two watches will have the same dials. I like good dials in general. Uh, those, are, those are the things I picked up from all these people that I met uh, and also interacted with. And I think that's important to emphasize because for people who are maybe new to the watch hobby or people who are on the outside who are not part of the community, it's easy to mistake this hobby for just rank materialism. But it's not just about buying a thing and having it. It's, it's about education. It's about a journey of learning. It's about uh, being immersed in the culture of the watch world and its history. And also meeting really cool people who become friends. Right, exactly. And also like get to know from, like let's say if, if somebody has this watch, you can actually ask them, hey, how do you like it? You know, is, is, it, is it something that you enjoy wearing it? And things of the nature. And not just that, right? Even like these, there are a couple of watches here that actually got it from the people from the group itself. So this, these two actually came from Debbie. This is like a brew metric. Uh, it's actually by uh, Jonathan Ferrer. He makes amazing watches. And, and this is this is brew right here for folks. Yes. Who, could you tell us a little bit about brew because it's going to be the introduction of the brand for a lot of folks watching this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was like I mean, it was introduced to me through Boston Watch Art Group. I did not know much about the brand. So he takes inspiration from coffee uh, in general. So all his watches are inspired by coffee. Uh, Hence mission. the name. Hence the name. Yeah, exactly. And also has a coffee bean uh, motif that you could see in the dial or on the on the crown as well. And clearly a predilection for 70s styles because yes. that's right up my alley. Right. And so a lot of fun, a uh, lot of value in these. These are not super expensive watches. And I think for folks who are maybe looking into the world of micro brands, that sub theme of your collection is worth exploring. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what appeals to you here. Cause obviously brew is not a major brand name. You're not doing it. So people will see that you're wearing a brew. Right. Um, describe, I guess, meeting Jonathan Ferrer and what his philosophy is design wise. Yeah. It's like, I think he's one of the nicest guys that I've seen. Uh, he's very genuine and like, I like his design language in general. And also I like coffee. And then his watches are very unique in its own way. And also they're from New York. Um, so, I mean, it's something that I can wear proudly, but it, the, it, he has a, a lot of people uh, fan following in general and he makes amazing watches. Like I said, it's very good value for the money that you spend on these watches. And they're pretty unique as well. Like they stand out from the crowd in terms of, uh, you know, a good value for the money that you spend as well. And they're not too big. And they're not booked. They're, they're perfect. And he, like I said, he get inspiration from the, 60s and the 70s, that, and it kind of comes with the design. And this one is in particular, like the metric is a fantastic watch. So this, you know, it's, they're, they're basic, but they're mechanical calibers. This is an H35 Seiko, I believe. 35, and then that is a Mecca Quartz. Yeah, so I mean, lots of technical interest, even at a fairly a, approachable price point. Uh, now you've got a Bamford over here, and I, I remember the days when they were known as a Rolex custom shop. Right. Times have moved on. All right. Okay. So this one has an interesting story too. Um, so uh, I wanted a Snoopy because I have a beautiful puppy, a, a Jack. So he's a beagle. A beagle. Right. So I wanted to get a Snoopy for him, but I mean, obviously, I'm still waiting on that one. So this one came in 2022, which also had uh, the the green, which is green is my favorite color. And so. It, the same time, I think the <laughs> me, me as well. <laughs> so this this is a very cool one, and this also surprisingly this is also GMT. Yes, uh, it, I think it's a Celita movement. It is a very playful watch. Uh, I think Bamford made in collaboration with Hodinki. They made about two hundred and fifty of them, and it was sold out. And I was lucky to get this one. So it was a pretty fun watch. Everybody loved this watch. It's yeah. kind of like a mini Panerai. <laughs> yeah, that has the same cushion case. So yeah. 
Definitely. So that's, that's a lot of fun. That's part of, I guess that, that counts as a micro brand, even though Bamford is, has occasionally run with bigger dogs. Right. But now this is killing me because I know this is a limited edition, uh, Middle Eastern input into a watermelon themed watch. Right. How'd this come together? Yeah. So, um, I, I looked into this watch, uh, you know, in internet, this was like a big sensation. Uh, and then I think Richard Bank, uh, the, he launched during the COVID time in 2020. This watch was like everybody's favorite in, in the internet, but I haven't seen one in person, so I was not sure how it looked like in, in, in reality. So I was, I met Michelle from Scottish Watches. He had this, the same watch, but not this one. He had that was like at the, Dubai Watch Week? Correct, yes. And he had like the, the mint chip cookie, but I really liked the dial and everything. It, it was fantastic, a good summer watch as well. But by the time I want to build the trigger, it was sold out. And then I met actually Richard Bank in um, in the wind up, and then and interestingly he was also fond of this watch. He he actually took a good picture of this and he was wearing it on the wind up too. That's when I met him and I saw that in person the watermelon, and then later on I was following them and then they made a collaboration with Perpetual in Dubai um, with the Eastern Hindu numerals. Um, so that's when I got it. I think it's. They made uh, 250 of those four different colorways. Uh, and this is the most sought after, and I was lucky to get that one. Yeah, a studio underdog. Uh, it's it's cool because it's got a ST1901, which is an overseas copy of a Venus 175. So it's a genuine lateral clutch column wheel chrono. It's got the very subtle use of Eastern Arabic numerals, not just in, not just for the hours, as is common, but for the tachymeter and the sub-registers, too. Everything, yeah. So when they launched in the Purple Chill, people were asking, how is it different from the regular watermelon? Then you need to look closely, and that's when you see those intricate details. It's a nice size, too. It's very perfect, yeah. So these, 39, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a very cool watch. And remember, the first time I saw one of those, it was actually out in L.A. in the midst of like a high-end independent kind of get-together. There was a lot of Jorn, Debatoon, Voodelain, and I saw this, and that's the watch I remembered from that experience. It's a good summer watch. Uh, I mean, I would wear it any time of the year, but good summer watch. Maybe this is a, I don't know, fall, winter watch, or the, maybe the height of summer because it's really green. But this is the Mr. One, I guess, MR01 from Baltic. Right. right. A fun watch and only 36 millimeters. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a good watch. And Baltic makes in three different colorways. I think the silver, blue, and the salmon. This again, they made in collaboration with Perpetual. They, I believe they made 250 or 300 of these. Uh, again, Eastern Hindu numerals. Okay, that is very, very cool. Yeah. Now, I know there's another watch in here. You call it the Diet Pepsi. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's one of your many GMTs. So right. tell me the tale behind this watch because I know it's personal. Right, yeah. So in 2018 is when uh, this Tudor came with this colorway. Uh, and it was very hard to get that at that point in time. And I was lucky to get that because my brother picked it up from Mohammed and Siddiq and Sons in 2020. I called it the Diet Pepsi. And it's also like, I call this like the July 4th watch as well because the colorway kind of matches with that. And also in the strap, if you see, there's a We the People. Like, oh, you know, yeah, look at that. We there you go. And I love this burnished buckle you've got on it, too. Right. That, that's a nice piece. That I'm guessing that was not factory fit. No, it's not. It's, a, it's again custom from Joe, uh, the gentleman based in Germany. I got the strap from him. Very sharp. So now this is a lot of fun because you've got a lot of travel watches, and that's a, a theme within the collection. Uh, but to finish up on micro brands, you got one more, and this one's got a New York tie to it. Yep. Uh, this is a Laurier Sapphire. They made in collaboration with the Grand Central watch. Uh, they made about 99 of these. And Debbie got this watch and, and I told her the same thing, like, whenever you want to get, uh, you know, let it go, let me know. And then, uh, she was able to sell that, I think, at the last. Who, who is Debbie? Cause a lot of oh, folks Debbie is a good, know. she's a very good friend of us and she's in the Boston Watch Art group as well. And she's, she considers the Khaleesi of micro brands. So she has a lot of micro brands and this is one of her collection. Yeah. So if you're looking for micro brands, reach out to Debbie. <laughs> It's a beautiful watch. I mean, it's got a lovely teal dial. It's, right. You said it's inspired by the architecture of Grand Central Station? Yes, the paintings in the Grand Central uh, terminal, the, what you see on the uh, ceiling. And this is, this is the inspiration behind that. And also in the case back, if you see, I think there's a Grand Central um, terminal logo will be there. And now Grand Central Watch is one of the oldest and most established watch service operations right. in New York. And so 
you've got the namesake actually being in Grand Central Station, still working on watches. But then you've also got the imagery of some of the architecture, but you mentioned that the real thing no longer looks like this. Right. Uh, I think it was uh, damaged by the water, and then it looks different right now. And also, I mean, they had the store in Grand Central for like 70 years, so this is like the, the celebrity watch for them as well. So a very cool piece, New York themed. It's got a Miyota 9029 inside of it, so it's a true mechanical watch, which is always pleasing. And that is sort of the cross-section of your micro brands because you've definitely got a taste for fun dials and reasonably sized watches. I guess we can sort of segue now back into the mechanical and the higher end luxury. Uh, what we've got with this, I guess, SBGW 273? Correct, yes. You've got a smaller case and a fun dial. Right. It's a Kirazuri dial. It's the, the, the sparkling paint that, uh, you know, Grand Seiko uses. Um, this is like a Jembi Valley edition. They made three of them. SBGW 273, 275, and 277. Three different colorways. This is the only one that comes with the the tempered second hands. Uh, the other one, the other, rest of the two has like the steel uh, second hands. And that's that's fire tempered to make it work. Right. I've been told that uh, one gentleman in Grand Seiko actually makes them all uh, for them. And so was this your first Grand Seiko? Where did your passion for the brand start? Oh, so the first one is this one, the SBGJ235. This is the start, this started the journey with me from Grand Seiko. I accidentally found them, uh, they had the, the nature of time, uh, like a pop-up store in Spring Street in Soho. Interestingly, they're also known for spring drives, so it's, it's a coincidence they had on the Spring Street. Anyway, so I met, I randomly went into them because I, I did not know what it was. And I was no prior experience. With no, Grand Seiko. no prior experience. I mean, I, I know Seiko, but I didn't know anything about uh, Grand Seiko. I was, uh, you know, met by uh, this extremely fine German Dean Wang, um, Elias, and also Eric Downs. They educated me about this brand in particular. Um, the one, the model that I it piqued my interest at that point in time was the SBGK005, which also has a Montevate dial. But by the time I want to pull the trigger, it was already sold out. Uh, and then I was considering other watches. I met Joe Kirk, and then he also explained a lot of the heritage and hey, design. <laughs> a lot of designs about uh, Grand Seca in general, the 44 GSKs, the grammar design from the 1960s and whatnot. So I started liking the 44 GSKs in general. Uh, so this one piqued my interest, and I got this is a boutique edition with the Mount Evate dial, and also this also has a GMT functionality. Uh, that's the first watch that got into the world of Grand Seiko, and then then the next one is the one that you saw, the oh, GMB value. Yes. So here's the 273, here's the 235. Colorful dials, uh, this one Kirazuri, again this one the Mount Evate summit scatter pattern, if you will, just like the snow. But from the peaks of Iwate down to the depths of the earth, this is, in my opinion, the coolest dial on any watch in the last decade. Tell me about SBGK015, I think. This is the Riascendo. Right. right. Yes. So I, I've seen pictures of this when they released it. And this is a US specific edition. They made about 300. Uh, and then Grand Seiko, uh, you know, was like in, 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 in Luxembourg. They had never had the Grand Seiko when I reached out to them initially. But then in 2022, they had the authorized dealer for Grand Seiko. They were setting up um, the watches at the, on the day. There was one watch available. Um, and then by the time I showed up, it was sold out. But this one, they were able to get one from me all the way from Japan. So uh, Luxembourg and Annie made that uh, possible. Uh, and also Francois from um, Grand Seiko also helped me to get that one. It's a beautiful dial, beautiful watch, and it's it's... I wore that on the last GS9 club event. Everybody took a picture of it. Oh my God, yeah. And also, I would. <laughs> and also one of my good friends from GS9, RJ, uh, RJ Kamad, he also had the same watch and we took a lot of pictures with that as well. And this, uh, it did not come with the same strap, but I ordered this again from Aaron Bespoke, the same strap that's similar, but it's different color. And it kind of elevates the look of the watch. So it's a beautiful watch. And it's, I think, one of my prized positions that I have. It's a beautiful watch. Now, neither one of us, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but neither one of us has been to Japan. No. <laughs> I, I wanted to look up these underground caves, these underground lakes that supposedly inspired the style. Because I thought, you know, you've got an underground lake in a cave. It's going to be like murky, impenetrable slime. If there's water down there, it's going to be gross. 
the water is beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. The pictures don't do justice, and it's, it's unbelievable how they were able to get that on the dial. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's their mosaic pattern with the exact blue that you get when you shine a light into those underground lakes. So if you go, uh, you know, if you go to Japan and you're anywhere near the Ryosendo Caverns, do not miss that. And also, like the, the second hand is also curved along with the the minute hand, and that kind of elevates it. So if you look closely, it's actually curved um, along with the dial. It's fascinating how they did it. Just really gorgeous and. Uh, a super fun, like this is a dress watch. Oh, it is, yes. But it's not a frumpy dress watch. Right. Yeah, you know, it's not for like, you know, the guy who would otherwise wear like, I don't know, a breguet. <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's a young man's watch right, right. there. Uh, okay, speaking of young men's watches, you've got not one, not two, but three Casiokes. I guess this is for people of all age and the young at heart, but how'd you go from none to three? <laughs> so this is the first Casio that I got. Uh, is a daily beater that I used to wear at home, and I'm doing, uh, you know, when I, when I, I, I mean, I, I, there are things like Grand Seek I cannot wear all the time because of the Zarazo polishing. I don't want to destroy that. So if I want to wear something that, uh, you know, it, it takes me to the day, I, I wear a beater like this G Shock, which also, like I said, when I grew up, I also had a lot of ca Casio G Shock when I grew up. So I know like they can take anything and they, they take a beating. They're like built like a tank, like. You can throw anything at him, but like this still works fine. Metal cased, no less. Yeah, that one was different because it, they came up with the metal one. I mean, I always had the bla I mean, the plastic ones, so I wanted to try the metal one. So, so when your fine Japanese watches are, I, I suppose, threatened by the planned activity of the day, <laughs> you go with the Casio, and then you're all good. Yeah, they're also Japanese, so you're keeping it. You know. <laughs> You're playing it straight. You got your GS9 Club badge oh, right there. Uh, well, let me know about that because I know this box also comes by means of the GS9 Club, and I would love to know what membership actually entails. How did you discover them? So when you when you buy a watch, I think uh, right after 2017, I believe uh, you you can register yourself to the club, uh, and there's a lot of uh, you know amenities with the club in terms of. Uh, they send you newsletters and the specific magazines, and also the events are fantastic. They had the first, very first one in the U.S. at the Lincoln Jazz Center in 2021. They met a lot of uh, people, like I mentioned, RJ and Alex. And then the last year they had in Brooklyn, again, I met a lot of folks as well. Uh, and this year it's going to be in Los Angeles. So I, I made this box to carry all my Grand Seikos, uh, to safely in a box. Oh, very cool. I think this is just like an awesome way to meet people who are into a small brand because people who know about, you know, much less revere Grand Seiko, they're going to be few and far between. So it's great that there's one place where you can guarantee you're going to find those folks. <laughs> okay, so from Japan back to Europe, we're getting back into a Rolex Tudor track. Now let's talk a little bit about this FXD MN21 because this is very different from anything else in the collection. This is tactical. Right. Right, and then this uh, came out in 2022 in November. I initially did not like the watch uh, because I thought it was, it, it doesn't have like a lot of features. Or, like it, it did not speak to me initially. When yeah. I saw that- You in, didn't like the integrated lugs or the integrated loop on the lug. Right, like the fixed lug. I mean, it did not, uh, it, it, like, I never had these watches in, the, in that in the specification, so it, it did not sit well with me. Um, but I had to see that in person. And, and when I saw that in person in Lux and Bond, they had an event in uh, November. It just blew my mind and I was like, I want that watch. And lucky enough, they, they were able to get that one for me. And I think they had a limited run in 20, uh, 2021. Um, so this, again, the Mary National, if you see the case at the back, I think oh, yeah. it has it has a Marine National 2021. That's very cool because it's very different from what they've done in the past. And I think a lot of folks were waiting for some sort of uh, military tribute watch from Tudor. They do retro watches. They do tribute watches. Rolex doesn't do that. Tudor can. And so here we start to pay homage to the combat watches of the 60s and the 70s. And what's really fun for me is that this... This, this is still very closely tied to the French Armed Forces. Right. Uh, yes, exactly. And then I think the, the, the new one that they have, I think it's made in collaboration with the U.S. Navy SEALs. And then there's a different colorway, obviously, that has the black and also like the red uh, text on it. This one is entirely blue. And then I got this strap from Erika. Uh, again, it's a, I got the French flag in it to go with the, the Marine National theme. 
So that's very, very cool. So a, a modern day military issue watch and that catapults us from the world of Tudor into the world of the big brother. So for a long time as a watch enthusiast, you admired Rolex, but you realized fairly soon after getting into the hobby that you couldn't just go into a dealer and get one. Right. What, what was that like? So as I was very naive initially. Look, I, I thought if you had, uh, you know, if you had the cash, you can get these uh, Rolex watches. But I was, it's not the case. And they educated me in terms of why it's so hard. And then I got to know them uh, and understand how what it takes to get the watch. And that's how uh, you know it took me a while to get it. Um, the first watch came right before um, my the birth of my daughter. Um, again, this I got from Lux and Bond. And he was kind enough to get it for me just before she, uh, Joanna was born. And, and you wore it when, when she was born? Yes, I had that in my hand when she was born. So this is one of those never sell watches? No, no, never. Now it's cool that you finally did get into the world of Rolex after really a lifetime of admiring them. Uh, when you first attempted to buy one and walked into the dealer and found out it wasn't that easy, what year was that, 18, 19, 20? Yeah, uh, uh, 2018. Um, uh, but again, like I said, I, I, I did not know what to expect. And it was also like a learning experience for me to understand. And that's when I started to read on blogs and understand from other watch uh, enthusiasts what it takes to get a watch uh, of Rolex. And you did it the old-fashioned way. You stood in line at the dealer, yes. you waited for your number to come up. Right. Yes. I mean, I didn't do any shortcuts to get my uh, name on the board. I, I, I waited my while, uh, time to get it. And like I said, Lux and Mon was very kind of to get it. And recently they took me to a U.S. Open tennis uh, game to watch Djokovic uh, in, in, in a game as well. So, so The dealer who sold you the watch set right. that up. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they set this even up. They have a lot of events going on. And also, it's uh, we had this conversation earlier as well. I think the brands and the dealership, they should have these events to kind of entertain you at the same time, educate you to know them, uh, to know you well, know the other uh, collectors and know other friends. And it actually helps the brand. It also helps you to know broaden your network and knowledge. And it strikes me that a lot of the problems that are arising from you know the waiting lists for Rolex watches, it comes down to the way this is explained to the client and what the dealer does to add value in the experience while you're waiting for the watch or after you get the watch. Explaining politely why the watch isn't available is a whole lot better than just saying we're not taking orders or go somewhere else. Right, yes. I mean, it, it, I think the, the way they need to convey the message is important. Um, I know a lot of people waited in line, but they didn't get the... They didn't get the call, but that's that's it is what it is. I mean, life moves on, but you you, know, you need to do everything that you can do. Things might work out, things don't work out, but that's life. Yeah, but I mean, I just hear from so many people who are looking at these kind of watches. I went into the dealer, no one would talk to me. I asked about the watch. They said, "Don't bother." You've got the same shortage, no matter. I mean, many dealers are going to have the same shortage, right. but one dealer is going to do a great job of showing respect, explaining the situation, and mm -hmm. giving you realistic expectations, and the other dealer, who's got exactly the same backlog of orders, is going to blow you off, offend you, and make an enemy. Right. So the way you phrase this is important. And then, you know, scheduling events you can go right. to, yep. that's very cool. So and I guess you went back then for the lefty. Right. This I picked up... Um uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this is not from Luxembourg. This is actually from Turno, uh, Boucher, um, uh, Cloud that I work with for a long time. He was able to get this one for me. And uh, interestingly, the day I got this is when my brother, who had like twin daughters, they were discharged from the hospital as well. So even though I got this watch, I think this he, he needs to, I will be giving that to him in the memory of the two wonderful daughters that he has. Oh, that's, and that's downright touching. That's very cool. Maybe uh, in the future uh, we'll have a different collective conversation with the extended family. Yeah, I mean, he, he helped me a lot to get some of the watches. I think there's the least I could do. And then touching upon the Rolex shortage and things like that, right? So if you're like in dire need of get a watch, I think if the, the AD doesn't work out and if you want a watch, let's say if you're getting married and you want a Rolex watch, and then I think that's when they could reach out to like, you know, places like Watchbox where you Appreciate have them, that. you have them readily available. So that, that's one way to get that. And not necessarily you have to stay in line and then, you know, change the wedding dates and whatnot. But you know, it's readily available here. So yeah, well, that's true. There's a sliding scale between time and money. Instant gratification costs more money. If you want to get it at retail, you got to spend more time. Right. Now, I love that you got a green watch theme: straps, dials, bezels. <laughs> uh, it really does come across as the one like tie that binds everything in here. Right. So now we're kind of at the point where I'm wondering, 
What comes after all of this? I mean, is there, is there a direction you have in mind? Is there some style of watch or brand that you haven't explored? Or is there a Grail watch? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think I don't have a Grail watch yet. I used to think it was Rolex. Now I have them. Uh, I think I want to explore on the high horology, like H. Moser, Chapek. Um, you know, recently I, 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 uh, I seen some other watch and Gornfield as well. The way, the way I seen the watch that made and also the one three liner that I, that you showed me, I think that, that piques my interest as well though, how it's the integrated bracelet and how it's ergonomically designed. I think it's a wonderful watch. I think H. Moser is, H. Moser or Chapek is where I'm thinking. But I, I mean, again, it, it, like I said, the, the first watch that I wanted was different from the watch that I landed in. So you never know, it has a lot of surprises. And that makes this journey beautiful, too. Well, it is non-linear. I mean, your collection, yes, it includes watches from Rolex. It will include high horology, which interests you now. But even if you are shooting for high horology, your next watch could very easily be another cool micro brand. Well, you never know. Yes, exactly. Uh, speaking of which, I have a brew that uh, Jonathan made in collaboration with Wand and Wand that I think I, I made the purchase, it's on its way, I should be getting that number. It's a, it's a cool little, uh, I think it's different from this metric that I have. It's a very cool watch and I think they made only 200 of them. Okay, so your next watch could very well be Chapek, Debitun, Moser, or Brew. The Brew is coming, but the other things, uh, we'll, 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 time will tell. John, thank you for keeping it real, this has been a blast. <laughs> thank you so much, Tim.